Alexa, what time is it? It's 12.52 p.m. and OU still sucks. She's right, you know. What's up, guys? VK Brad Kellner. Today is Friday, October 8th, 20 and 21, the day before the Red River Shootout. The Longhorns and Sooners getting set to duke it out once again at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. And this one should be a doozy. Most of them are doozies. But uh, a lot of times in the last 10 or 11 years, Oklahoma has been a heavy favorite against Texas going into this one. Not so much the case this year. OU is still favored. They are the higher ranked team. They come into this game undefeated while Texas comes in with one loss. But uh, right now, Vegas has this as a three point line. And regardless of what the line is, man, you throw that stuff out the window. You throw records, you throw eye test, you throw everything out the window when it's Texas OU week. And it is here. It is upon us once again. I'll be headed up to the Metroplex tonight after the show in Houston. And uh, looking forward to the game tomorrow. I'll be at the Horn Tailgate tomorrow morning. So uh, for those of you who are making their way to the State Fair tomorrow, definitely stop by there. And hopefully I'll get the chance to uh, run into a few of you guys up before the game. I, I don't even know where my tickets are, but I've got a ticket. Ticket in there tomorrow. And I can not wait. Texas and Oklahoma. The Sooners coming in once again undefeated 5-0. and We'll go matchup by matchup. We'll go kind of quick. I won't keep you all too long today because I'm sure you all have Friday night plans and I'm sure you all are amped up getting ready to go for tomorrow morning. But we'll kind of go matchup by matchup, position by position, and uh, break down what to expect from Texas and Oklahoma tomorrow morning. It should be a hot one. Temperatures expected to be in the low 90s, but the sun is going to be out, so weather shouldn't be too much of a factor tomorrow. Oklahoma comes into this one undefeated, but they've been a very underwhelming team through the first five weeks of the season. They are 5-0. and They're still ranked in the top 10. They're number six right now, which is actually a couple of spots below where they started the season, and boy, they've struggled. It's been a struggle for OU. Uh, you go back to their season opening game against Tulane, right? They had a huge lead against the Green Wave at halftime, a big lead into the third quarter, and almost let it slip away. Had to hold on for dear life. Had to get a fourth down stop to uh, beat Tulane as a 30-plus point favorite. After that, they dominated Western Carolina, an FCS team, 76 to nothing there. But uh, since then, it's been pretty tough sledding for Oklahoma, guys. They played four FBS teams this year, and – All four of those games have been decided by one score. So we talked about the Tulane game. They beat Nebraska by just a touchdown. They needed a last-second field goal to beat West Virginia at home. West Virginia, who just lost to Texas Tech, and we all know what Texas did to Texas Tech a couple of weeks ago in Austin. And then last week, OU for my money, uh, 76 to nothing, I guess, is their most impressive performance. But against quality competition, for my money, Oklahoma's most impressive performance of the season, going on the road, beating K-State's by six. Now, technically, they didn't cover the spread, but K-State has been a thorn in the side for Oklahoma the last few years. Kind of like what TCU has been to Texas, K-State has been that for Oklahoma. So, OU didn't really care how it looked. They just wanted to leave the little apple with a win, and they did. And Spencer Rattler was incredibly efficient. I thought it was his best performance of the year. So, that's Oklahoma uh, 5-0 and coming into this game. Texas has played a much tougher schedule, guys. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Texas has gone up against tougher teams here in the early going than Oklahoma has. And, look, Texas obviously has a loss, and it was an embarrassing loss. But outside of that, the Longhorns have fared pretty well against some quality competition this season. So Texas comes in in 2021 a little bit more battle-tested, I think, than Oklahoma has just with the schedules these two teams have played over the first five weeks of the season. Here's the exact stat. I was filibustering there uh, to try to find it. Oklahoma has played one team with a winning record thus far this year. The combined record of their opponents is nine and 17. Meanwhile, Texas has played three teams with winning records in 2021. The combined record of the Longhorns opponents, 16 and eight. So Texas, once again, a little bit more battle tested the schedule over the first month. Plus it's been a little bit more difficult than what Oklahoma's had to deal with. And Oklahoma has struggled against some, far inferior teams this year. So I don't think there's any doubt Texas is the best team that Oklahoma has gone up against this season. That probably holds true for Texas, right? OU is probably the best team that Texas has played, but Texas has had some tougher games on its slate to this point this year. Uh, We brought up Spencer Rattler's name a couple of minutes ago. Let's talk about Spencer Rattler, the Heisman favorite going into the season. A lot of people thought he was the favorite to be 1-1 in next year's NFL draft. 
He's been underwhelming this season. And Oklahoma's offense as a whole has been underwhelming, guys. I mean, this is Lincoln Riley's worst offense since he got to Norman, whether it's during his time as a head coach or during his time as the offensive coordinator in the last few years of the Bob Stoops era. Uh, Oklahoma's offense is struggling, especially based on what we're used to seeing from Oklahoma offenses. And it's just been a, a struggle for them, right? I mean, for lack of a better term. And the biggest thing that I've noticed about the Sooners' O in 2021, they lack explosivity. Right, the big playability that we've seen from them so many times in years past just hasn't been there consistently uh, for the Sooners in 2021, and that's causing them to struggle a little bit. I think the biggest reason why they don't have that explosive nature is the offensive line play. The offensive line play for Oklahoma has not been good. Now, their most complete performance of the season came last week against uh, K-State, so maybe they figured something out. They ran more split zone plays compared to the GT counter tray play that they've run and been successful with for so many years. Uh, but for the most part, guys, it's been a, it's been a problem for Oklahoma. And we're not used to seeing that, right? Bill Bedenball, their offensive line coach is one of the best in the business. And it feels like every year OU's offensive line is incredible. Like they lose guys to the NFL seemingly every season, but they find ways to figure it out. And that just hasn't been the case this year. They've really struggled replacing Creed Humphrey. They're all conference center, but just it, it hasn't been a good group for the Sooners this season, and that's making life very difficult for everybody. Uh, Spencer Rattler just hasn't had the time to chunk the ball down the field and pick up those big plays through the air. And more than that, Oklahoma's rushing attack just hasn't been good at all this season. And when you think about Oklahoma, like if you just watch the highlights, if you just watch Sports Center, you, you see like 60, 70 yard pass plays for OU, and you think that's all they do, right? It's like Mike Leach, they just throw the ball all the time. It's not the case. Like Lincoln Riley's offense is based on the run. And if the run's not there, it's going to make life tough for whoever's playing quarterback. And that's been the issue for the Sooners this year. Uh, in the game against West Virginia a couple of weeks ago, 28 carries for 57 yards for the Sooners. Two yards a clip against a, a decent West Virginia defense. Like they just, they couldn't get anything going on the ground in that game. And that's been a problem for Oklahoma all year long. And I think that's led to some of the uh, inconsistency that we've seen from Spencer Rattler. Spencer Rattler has been not great, but the reports of his demise, I think, are slightly exaggerated. I mean, he's still completing 76% of his passes, which is, I think, second in the country. He's still being pretty efficient, but, the uh, you know, he's he, the, his guys aren't getting open down the field. The deep playability isn't there. And he just doesn't look as good or as comfortable as he looked in the last seven games of last season when he was one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback in all of college football. That's why the projections going into this year were as high and strong as they were because Rattler closed out the year on such a high note. People figured it would translate to 2021 and it just hasn't been the case, but he's still, he's still good guys. In my mind, he's the better quarterback in this game. I know Casey Thompson has been pretty good since taking over uh, a few weeks ago. But uh, I still think Spencer Rattler is the better quarterback in this game going in. So there's a little bit about Oklahoma's offense, no explosive plays. The run game, their, their, their depth in the running back room is not where it has been in the past as well. And I think that's creating some issues. They've got a couple of guys who should be really good. Kennedy Brooks, we've seen him in the past. He's solid. Eric Gray, the transfer from Tennessee, had a great career in Knoxville. You know, He's been okay this year, but those guys just aren't putting up the numbers that – uh, I expected them to, uh, and the numbers that anybody expected them to, and most of that has to do with just the offensive line not being as athletic or agile enough to uh, block for that GT counter tray play, which, once again, has just been damn near unstoppable for Lincoln Riley since he uh, since he got to Norman. And that was a staple in the Bob Stoops era, too. That's just been Oklahoma's big running play. People will know it's coming, and they still can't stop it. Well, this year, teams have been able to stop it, so – that's the weakness. That's the big matchup right there, guys. You know my stance on the lines of scrimmage. I say this about every game, and it's no different going into this one this Saturday, tomorrow. Uh, games are won and lost in the trenches. And the matchup between Oklahoma's struggling, inconsistent offensive line against Texas's defensive line, which going into the year was the best position group for this defense. And I had a confidence, and I think just about everybody who covers or follows the team had confidence that the Texas defensive line was – one of the better D lines in the conference and one of the better D lines in the country. Texas has had its issues up front. They haven't been as dominant throughout the course of the first five games as I would like, but I still think on paper and with what I've seen from OU's offensive line, that's advantage Texas there. So hopefully the, uh, the guys up front for UT can impose their will a little bit against this OU offensive line and make Spencer Rattler beat you. I mean, he got benched in this game a year ago. Like the moment for a while was too big for him. 
Uh, see if you can get in his head a little bit today. And I think the best way to slow down Oklahoma's offense is to stifle the rushing attack. So Keandre Coburn, Moro Ajomo, Tavondre Sweat, those guys up the middle, Alfred Collins as well, uh, need big performances from those guys, need them to live up to their preseason hype and uh, win that matchup in the trenches against the Oklahoma offensive line. Uh, need a better performance by the Texas linebackers this week. Those guys have been solid this year, DeMarvion Overshone and, and Luke Brockermeyer. Brockermeyer's been a great story. Uh, but against TCU, those guys struggled a little bit in coverage, and they also struggle with missing tackles. So uh, would like more for them uh, from them tomorrow as well. They're going to be a big part in slowing down that Oklahoma rushing attack as well. Uh, curious to see how the Sooners try to run the football, though. If they go more split zone, which worked against K-State last week, or if they go to what has been their bread and butter uh, over the last few years in Norman. Uh, on the outside, Oklahoma's receivers – you know, Marvin Mims is a stud, but the passing numbers aren't as gaudy from OU as they have been in the past. Mike Woods, the transfer from Arkansas. I wonder if he's regretting at all leaving Arkansas uh, to go to OU. I guess Arkansas just lost last week, and OU's ranked higher, and they're a better football team. They've got a better chance to make some noise this year. But uh, anyways, Drake Stoops is still there. Feels like that guy's been there forever. Uh, obviously was a big factor in the game last year between these two teams. You don't have like, I mean, Marvin Mims is really good, and I think Mike Woods is pretty good too, but you don't have a Hollywood Brown. You don't have a Sterling Shepard. You don't have a C.D. Lamb. Like, there's no bona fide, obvious first-round talent on the outside for Oklahoma. So, hopefully the Texas secondary can play pretty well. Josh Thompson is back uh, after missing the TCU game with a concussion. I thought Darian Dunn did great in his stead. Uh, like, Darian Dunn should play more. And if Thompson or Jamison struggles tomorrow, then – you got to put Darian Dunn in the game, and I don't think you feel too bad about any sort of drop-off between starter and CB number three on the outside because Dunn was great last week, and he's been really good in his uh, opportunities this season. So I'm glad that he's got some actual playing time under his belt now, and I feel pretty good about that position. Would love more from the safeties. Feel like we're not calling their name that much, uh, but uh, hopefully those guys can step up tomorrow. Texas, for the most part, has done pretty well at limiting big plays. We talked about that being a weakness for the Oklahoma offense this year. For the most part, Texas has been okay of keeping things in front of them. Uh, you think of a couple of plays in the second half of that Texas Tech game, and you say, what are you talking about, BK? Those were bad. Those were breakdowns. Those can't happen against Oklahoma because you're not going to score 70 against Oklahoma. Uh, but hopefully Texas can, can do what they've done for the most part this year and keep things in front of them. So that's when Oklahoma has the ball. What about when Texas has the ball? Oklahoma's defense has been its strength this year, guys. It really has. Feels weird to say, but uh, that's been the case. And look, the matchup that's going to decide this football game tomorrow is Bijan Robinson and just the Texas rushing attack as a whole against OU's rush defense, which has been really good this year. And they were really good last year, too. Uh, over the last 18 games, dating back to last season, I guess two years ago. Um, no, that's last season. I don't know. Last 18 games. I saw this stat. I shouldn't have tried to do math. I'm terrible at that. Y'all know that. Uh, OU's only allowed one player to go over 100 yards, and that was Brees Hall in the Iowa State game last year. And Iowa State beat Oklahoma, so shows the importance of running the football against this Sooners defense. Uh, Bijan's the best running back in the country right now. Best running back in the conference, no question. He'll be the toughest guy that Oklahoma's had to go up against this year, but OU has gone up against some good running backs, and Letty Brown at West Virginia and Deuce Vaughn at K-State, and OU fared pretty damn well. I think they held both of those guys under four yards of carry well below their season averages. So that's the matchup right there, guys. I mean, B look, if Bijan goes for 200-plus like he has the last couple of weeks, then Texas is going to win this game, and they're probably going to win this game by a couple of scores. But if Oklahoma wins that battle and keeps Bijan under 100 yards, then – Oklahoma's probably going to win this football game, guys. And, of course, it's not just Bijan. It's Rojo. It's Keelan Robinson, too. But uh, we know who the bell cow is. We know who the number one is. We know Sark isn't scared to use Bijan the way Tom Herman was scared to use him last year. So Bijan's going to get some carries. Uh, Texas is going to ride that dude. He's got to be good. And the O-line's got to be good, too. I mean, Bijan's good enough to break a tackle or two on every single carry. And even if he doesn't get great blocking up front, he can make something out of nothing. But you want uh, some holes created for that guy, and hopefully that happens. OU's D-line is really good, and they won't have Jalen Redmond tomorrow. He's out with a meniscus injury. That's good. He's one of their better interior D-linemen, but uh, Isaiah Thomas is legit. Perion Winfrey is legit. Nick Benito's an edge. He's a first-round talent. He's a stud, too, and he gets involved in the run game as well. 
Uh, that'll be a test for the Texas offensive line, which will be, of course, without Denzel Okafor, who is out for the season after the injury he suffered last week. So Kerstetter at left guard, Andre Carrick at right tackle. Those guys fared pretty well in those spots against TCU, uh, but Oklahoma's D-line is a step up from what TCU had last week. So there's your biggest matchup, and I'm curious to see how Sark uses Bijan, not only in the run game, but also in the pass game as well. Same thing with Rojo, same thing with Keelan. We've seen more you know, two backs on the field at the same time from Texas this year, but I would love to see more of it. I mean, I just – I would love to see Bijan and Rojo or Bijan and Keelan on the uh, Keelan on the field at the same time. I think all of those guys are impact players. Keelan can be a weapon in the passing game. We've seen that at times this year. I would use that, and this is the game you use it for, right? You pull out all the stops against Oklahoma. I think Sark knows the importance of this game. I don't think he's going to hold anything back going up against a very good defensive coordinator and Alex Grinch, who's done really, really good things in his now two and a half years in Norman. This is year three for Alex Grinch up there. So yeah, can Texas run the ball efficiently, effectively tomorrow? That'll be a key. And just how much does Sark get his running backs involved in the passing game? Because the receivers for Texas have been pretty inconsistent. I mean, I, I, Xavier Worthy for a true freshman, he's exceeded my expectations, but just one catch last week. Jordan Whittington's really good, but you know, inconsistent performances at times this year. This will be his first Texas OU. Um, and then, like, that's it. I mean, Joshua Moore is 10 catches for 76 yards, guys. It's five games into the season. That's year four for Joshua Moore. Like, I was expecting that guy to take a big step in Sark's offense, and he just hasn't done it. Um, there was a deep shot last week, I think, first series of the game where Casey Thompson just missed him. Like, Josh Moore did his job. He got by the defense, but the throw was bad from Casey Thompson. Outside of that, though, just haven't called Joshua Moore's name enough this season. So I wonder if Sark is like less Joshua Moore, less three receiver sets, and he already has done less three receiver sets than Tom Herman did. But I wonder if maybe Keelan is a bigger part of the passing game than uh, a guy like Joshua Moore tomorrow. Uh, I do expect to see a lot of 12 personnel, though. The tight end blocking has improved dramatically this year for Texas. Cade Brewer's been great. He's not Andrew Beck or anything like that when it comes to run blocking, but he's gotten a lot better there. Give Jeff Banks and Kyle Flood, I assume, uh, some credit for that. Those guys are going to be important, creating holes for this Texas rushing attack tomorrow. So the running game's got to be there, and the deep ball has to be there for Texas. I think Casey Thompson is 3 of 16 on deep balls this year. Uh, that's it's not good. It's not good. It's not going to cut it against Oklahoma. And Oklahoma's weakness is their secondary, right? Their rush defense is great. Number one in the Big 12 right now. I gave some of the numbers earlier. Uh, their pass defense, I think, is eighth in the conference. They're going to be down a starting corner in this game tomorrow as well. So, like, on paper, that's where your advantage should be. But the Texas passing attack has been inconsistent at times. Casey Thompson was not that good against TCU last week. Did pick up some big plays with his legs, a couple of key third down conversions, had that 40 plus yard run in the first quarter, but and 12 passing completions for 142 yards uh, against TCU last week. Like you're going to need more than that from Casey Thompson in this passing game this weekend, Casey Thompson in his three starts, 15 completions, 18 completions, 12 completions. I don't, I don't think any of those are going to be enough against Oklahoma. Uh, obviously you want to be able to run the ball as effectively as you have in the last couple of weeks, but I just, you can't bank on that. Uh, against a, a much better defense than what you've gone up against the last few weeks. So that'll be a test, and that falls on the O-line too, giving Casey Thompson some time to make some plays. We talk about this game being won and lost in the trenches. Uh, that's been the case the last couple of years. Sam Ellinger was sacked six times last season and nine times the year before, 15 sacks in the previous two meetings between these two. Needless to say, that can't happen. <laughs> if Texas wants to win this football game tomorrow, Casey Thompson has to get time to throw the football. The O-line has to hold its own because OU secondary is weakness. They're vulnerable. And if you give Casey time to throw the football, he's going to find some openings. I mean, OU playing zone defense right now is a disaster. It's like a free play, free space on your bingo card. If uh, OU's in zone, they've just been that bad and that inconsistent on the back end this year so. Pick up your twist and your stunts, Texas offensive line, because that's been what Alex Grinch has done a bunch against Texas the last couple of years, and Herb Hand had no answer. Hopefully Kyle Flood does. Uh, the O-line's been good, better this year. I'm hesitant to say good. They were awful in Fayetteville. They've improved since then. Uh, can they be good against Oklahoma's defense, which they've got the best front Texas has seen since Arkansas, and I would argue they've got a better defensive front than uh, than Arkansas does. So 
Trying to think what else, guys. Um, any other key matchups right there? You know, protect the football. The turnover battle's huge. Texas won at three to one last week against TCU. That was the difference in the football game. Uh, create some turnovers. Make life miserable for Spencer Rattler if you can, and don't turn the ball over yourself. Uh, I would love for this to be Casey Thompson's first start without an interception. He's got one in each of the previous three games. That would be nice. Protect the ball. But um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything, guys. I think that might be it. I'll be up there tomorrow. Come say hi. I'll be at the Horn Tailgate for a little bit. And check out the 1-0 podcast that I did with Joe Cook for more insight and preview of Texas and Oklahoma. And that's it. Like this video if you haven't yet. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't yet. I feel like I'm forgetting something. I'm sure I am. This is going to be a close game. Every regular season matchup between these two teams going back to 2014 has been decided by one score. I don't think tomorrow is any different, guys. So buckle up. Should be another doozy with college game day in attendance at the State Fair of Texas tomorrow. It'll be nice to have a full crowd, a full house at the Cotton Bowl. Last year was weird, but it's the best scene in college sports. And uh, I'm excited and lucky to be a part of it tomorrow. So subscribe, like, shout out to Last Stand Hats, today's video sponsor. Use code BK10 at checkout for 10% off your purchase of any Last Stand hat. That's it for today's video. We'll be back next week to recap Texas and Oklahoma and also start to preview Texas and Oklahoma State. The Pokes undefeated, and they have a bye this week. They could be a top-10 team when they come to Austin next Saturday. One more time. Hey, Alexa, what time is it? It's 1.13 p.m., and OU still sucks. Yeah, you got that right. Thank you all for watching. Until next time, y'all stay safe, y'all stay healthy, and hook them. And, oh, yeah, OU still sucks.